Hello, future nurses. Welcome. So today we're going to be talking about chapter 25 of our book. Um, specifically, we're going to be talking about the infection cycle portion of our book. If you want to read the, if you want to learn more about the other sections, go and watch the other videos. But this is a subject I love talking about because the last thing we want is for patients coming to us and leaving us sicker than when they came. So infection control is very, very important. So to begin, we're going to talk about microorganisms. Now, these microorganisms are everywhere. However, how much harm a specific microorganism does can vary. And what I mean by that is that not all of these microorganisms are actually dangerous. As you might know, some microorganisms are actually important that for you to live. Some microorganisms are essential for your gut to function properly, for instance. Whether or not a, a microorganism is harmful largely depends on what kind of microorganism you're dealing with, what kind of microorganism you're dealing with, um, where the microorganism is, who the microorganism is affecting, and the situ general situation. Now, when I say who the microorganism is affecting, I'm referring to something called a host. A host is the living person or thing where the infectious, parasitic, or pathogenic microorganism is residing. So an important word for us to know is the word antimicrobials. Antimicrobials are our defense against these microbes, these harmful microbes. These include antibiotics, which are specifically for bacteria um, and other types of drugs, which are for fungi, parasites, viruses, and other types of antimicrobials. So people often use the word antimicrobial and antibiotic interchangeably. However, they're technically not interchangeable, okay? Uh, an antibiotic is a subset of an antimicrobial. Now, an antibiotic is a subset of an antimicrobial that's specifically designed to treat bacterial infections. Antifungal um, infections, on the other hand, are another subset of antimicrobial that are specifically designed to treat um, fungal infections. However, antimicrobial is, is, is the umbrella term used for all of the drugs that fight microbes. So we're moving on to our first knowledge check. What is the difference between antimicrobials and antibiotics? A, antimicrobials and antibiotics are the same. B, antibiotics treat viruses while antimicrobials treat bacteria. C, antibiotics specifically treat bacteria while antimicrobials treat agents against bacteria, fungi, parasites, and viruses. D, antimicrobials are used to, for fungal infections, while antibiotics are for bacterial infections. I will be sharing the answer with you soon, so please go ahead and pause the video and get your answer in your mind. And I'll be sharing the answer in five, four, three, two, one. And the correct answer is C, antibiotics are specifically designed are specifically designed to target bacteria, while antimicrobials include agents against bacteria, fungi, and parasites, parasites and viruses. Now, this is correct because antibiotics are a subset of antimicrobials that specifically target bacterial infections. The other one you might have picked is D. Now, this is incorrect because antimicrobials also include agents for viruses and parasites not just fungal infections. Moving right along, let's talk more about what an infection is. So an infection is when a harmful micro microorganism or pathogen gets into or onto our bodies. These pathogens go through a cycle with six parts, including how they live their, leave their homes, how they move, how they enter a new host, and a bunch of other things, okay? Now, there's six parts of this cycle. This cycle is called the infection cycle. And the six parts are the infectious agent, reservoir, 
the port of exits, the means of transmission, the portals of entry, and the susceptible host. Now we're going to take a closer look at each part of these of this cycle, beginning with the infectious agent. Now, there are several types of infectious agents that can cause infection. The three most common, however, are bacteria, viruses, and fungi. Bacteria is the most common type of infectious agents that we're going to find in healthcare settings. Now, bacteria comes in various shapes and various uh, 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 sizes, and they can be classified by their shapes, but they can also be classified by how they react to a special stain called a gram stain. Bacteria can either be gram positive or gram negative. So gram positive bacteria has a thick outer layer that turns purple when we use a special dye on them because this these gram positive bacteria have a a, a thick outer layer that helps the bacteria to resist decolori decolorization or the loss of color. However, when we have a gram-negative bacteria, they have a thin outer layer and um, they can be easily decolorized. So they turn pink or red when we put them in the same dye. Knowing whether a bacteria is gram-positive or gram negative is important for infection control because some antibiotics are only effective against gram positive um, microorganisms, for example. Now, the other way that we can ca ca characterize bacteria is by whether or not they need oxygen. If bacteria needs oxygen, we call it aerobic bacteria. An easy way to remember this is that the word aerobic sounds like air. Aerobic air, oxygen. However, if a bacteria cannot survive without oxygen, it is anaerobic. So aerobic bacteria requires air, while anaerobic does not require air. The next infectious agent we're going to talk about are viruses. Viruses are interesting because antibiotics can't kill them. For some viruses, however, antibiotics might weaken them but an antibiotic can't replace um, getting a vaccination, for example, because you need some kind of antiviral to fight these viruses. Now, during the prodromal, during the pro prodromal stage of an infection, which is the stage where the infection has started, but the symptoms are still mild, they're just starting to show, during this prodromal phase, antivirals are really the most effective. This is really when you want to get that, um, that, that vaccine in there because this is when um, the antiviral is going to be the most effective for shortening the length of the illness. That is why when we're treating HIV, for instance, it's best that we start antiretroviral um, therapy or ART as early as possible because we're going to prevent um, the bacteria from completing its cycle and begin the, not bacteria, I apologize, the virus from completing its um, cycle and beginning to replicate. Next knowledge check. We love knowledge checks. Okay, which stage of the infection is most effective for administering antiviral medications? A, the incubation stage. B, the prodromal stage. C the full, full stage illness, or D, convalescence? Take a moment, pause, answer the question, and I'll be giving you the answer in a five, four, three, two, one. And the correct answer is the prodormal phase. Antivirals are the most effective during the prodormal phase when symptoms have just started to um, to, to, to appear. Okay, moving on. Back to our infectious agents. The last infection, oh, well, the, not the last, the second to last infectious agent we have to talk about is fungi. Now, fungi are plant-like organisms that you can find in the air, in the soil, and water, and they can cause infection in people too. So common 
fungal infections include athlete's foot, ringworm, and yeast infections. To treat these kind of infections, we would use a special kind of antimicrobial called antifungals. Now, the last one, the last infectious agent we're going to talk about are parasites. Now, these are organisms that um, either live on or in the host. And the key aspect of them, the key, the, the thing to really remember about parasites is that they use their host for nutrients. They use their host to survive. Okay, moving on. Now, let's talk about an important concept. Okay, remember how we talked about the fact that not every microorganism we come with in contact with is harmful. In fact, not every microorganism we come in contact with is going to make us sick, right? Whether or not a microorganism makes us sick, whether or not it leads to disease, depends on several factors. The first of these is the number of the microorganisms that we come in contact with. You can think of it this way. The more germs you're exposed to, the higher the chance the germs are going to overpower your immune system and you're going to get sick. The next is the virulence of the microorganism. This is this all this means is the strength of the germ. So some germs are naturally stronger and are more likely to cause disease than other uh, than other other microorganisms. Then we have your immune system, the host immune system, right? This is your body's defense team. The stronger your immune system is, the better it can fight off microorganisms. That's why you'll see some people getting sick less often. And then lastly is the length and the, it the intimacy of your contact with that microorganism. So the longer or the closer you're in contact um, with that microorganism, the that can increase your risk for getting sick. So now that we know what infections are, let's talk about how these diseases are classified. Before we can treat an infection, somebody has to figure out what the infection is, okay? And there are two words that you'll hear in the process of identifying infections, okay? The first is endemic. This means that the infection that this infection is normally found in a specific area or in a specific um, population. For instance, malaria is endemic in parts in many parts of Africa and in many parts of Asia. And a pandemic, on the other hand, is a global outbreak of a new virus. Um, the key factor, in pan one of the key factors in pandemics is that at the start of a pandemic, we have no specific vaccine for the infection and no specific or no specific treatment for it either. Okay, in terms of infectious agents, the last word that you need to know is colonization. When a microorganism is present or in a host, but there are no symptoms of the infection yet, um, we say that the person is colonized. Is colonized. However, once the host starts to show specific symptoms of the disease, now there's an infection. So it's possible that I can look into a microscope, look into a lab sample, and see that, hey, this person has E. coli in their gut. They've been colonized. However, they haven't started showing symptoms. They're not sick. So that way I couldn't, they're not sick yet. I couldn't say that there's an infection. However, once they've started showing symptoms, now I would be able to correctly say that, hey, this person has an infection. Going back to the infection cycle, now let's talk about the reservoir component. So reservoir is basically the home where these microorganisms live, grow, and multiply. There are various types of reservoirs. For instance, a human being can be a reservoir. Um, some people show symptoms of a disease, while other people who are reservoirs are... Um, are, are carriers, but they're not actually showing any any signs of the disease of the of the infection yet. Um, animals can also be another type of reservoir. Um, think about rabies, which can be transmitted by a dog bite or bite a, a bat bite, or maybe um, the West Nile virus, which can be spread by mosquitoes. 
Then we can also have environmental reservoirs. So for instance, soil. Soil can arbor um, the microorganisms that cause diseases like tinnitus. And um, water can contain harmful microbes like E. coli or food if it's not properly cooked or handled can also be a reservoir for pathogens. Okay, moving on to the next part of the infection cycle, we're going to talk about the portal, the portal of exit. So the portal of exit for microorganisms is essentially how the microorganism is going to leave the body or the reservoir and go out and potentially um, infect other people. Understanding these exit routes is very important for preventing the spread of infection. Um, each type of microbe has a preferred way for leaving its host. For instance, in humans, these exit points can include the respiratory tract um, where these uh, microbes are expelled when we cough or sneeze, or the um, gastrointestinal tract, um, when, for instance, maybe the person vomits or, or um, the pathogens could exit in feces. Um, they could also exit um, in the, through urine or sexual, sexual fluids. Additionally, they can exit through skin. This isn't one we think about normally, but they can exit through skin, um, through any breaks or wounds in the skin. So our blood, our tissues could actually act as um, portals of exit for pathogens. So as future nurses, it's important for us to understand these um, different portals of exit because this knowledge helps you to create effective inf infection control strategies, right? For instance, if you know that a pathogen would can exit through the respiratory tract, well, then you know that, hey, I should emphasize the use of, the use of masks in this situation to help prevent the spread of this particular pathogen. Next up is the means of transmission. So microorganisms can be transmitted from the reservoir in several different ways. First, there's direct contact transmission. So this happens when you're physically close to someone or and you're involving, um, you're, you're con doing activities like touching or kissing or sexual intercourse. So as healthcare workers, we have to be mindful of this as we can unintentionally transmit germs to our patients by just touching them. Um, there's also indirect contact transmission. This can happen through vectors. Now, a vector is a living thing that can transmit infection to humans. So an example of a vector would be insects, right? Or another way that in indirect um, transmission, contact transmission can happen is through something called a formite. Now, a formite is an inanimate, are the inanimate objects that we touch. So a common formite or something that can become a formite in healthcare settings is a stethoscope. If it's not properly, properly cleaned, it can become a formite. Um, and germs can be transferred from one patient to another through the use of the, the, that, seth, that stethoscope. Microorganisms can also spread through the air, um, what, like when you're coughing or when we're sneezing. This, this is divided into um, airborne transmission with tiny particles like droplet um, transmission or with um, larger particles. Now, this distinction is really, really important for infection control measures because like we saw um, with the recent virus, with the recent pandemic, um, once we knew that um, the pandemic, the infection which spread through droplets, um, strategies like hand washing and social distancing and wearing masks became recommended because we know that, hey, this can spread through, through, uh, <clears throat> this can spread through, through tiny particles. I apologize. In healthcare settings, understanding these, um, transmission routes can really help us to take the right precautions, like using personal protective equipment, 
during um, aerosol generating uh, procedures. Okay, knowledge check. A nurse is educating a patient about the ways microorganisms are transmitted. Which of the following should the nurse include as an, in, as an example of indirect contact transmission? A, a bite from a mosquito carrying the West Nile, West Nile virus. B, touching the skin of a person infected with chickenpox. C, inhaling chop, droplets from a sneeze of someone with influenza. Or D, eating undercooked meat contaminated with E. coli. Go ahead and pause the video, take a second to think about it, and I'll be back to let you know what the answer is. And I'll be sharing the answer in five, four, three, two, one. And the correct answer is A, a bite from a mosquito carrying the West Nile virus. Why is this? Well, remember, indirect contact involves a vector or a formite, which is, again, an inanimate uh, object. A vector is um, a, li a living creature that can transmit things. So a mosquito, in this case, would be acting as a vector for the West Nile virus. And this would be an example of indirect um, transmission. Moving right along, we are almost done um, to the portals of entry. Now, port the portals of entry for microorganisms is the way that microorganisms enter a new host. Think of this uh, like a doorway for germs. Um, if they can't find a way in, well, then they can't cause any harm. Interestingly, though, the ways that these microorganisms enter a new host is often the same way as they left the last one. So in human beings, a common entry point includes the skin, like through a cut or a wound, um, then there's the urinary tract where germs can enter during a procedure, during procedures or um, during procedures like inserting um, catheter, catheters. Oh gosh, can I say the word? Um, then there's also the respiratory tract, which is another major entry point where you know we can breathe in, breathe in germs. And then finally, we have the GI tract where we can ingest germs through things like contaminated food and water. Now, as a nurse, it's very important that you understand these because this, this is going to help you prevent and control infection. So if you know where the risks are, you can take steps to protect your patients. For instance, you know that when I am taking care of wounds, and I mean when you're taking care of patients in general, but when you're taking care of wounds in particular, it's important that you wash your hands, right? Because you want to block um, those, you want to prevent infection because you know that, hey, this wound is a portal of entry, a potential portal of entry. Okay, moving on to our last friend, the susceptible host. So for microorganisms to survive and thrive, they need a place to live and feed, which is usually a host like the human body. But that's not enough, usually. Um, they also need to be able to overcome the host's defenses, mainly the immune system. So sus susceptibility, um, how susceptible um, a host is, really depends on um, quite a few things. The biggest one, though, is how strong their immune system is, right? Think of it as a battle between the host's defenses and the invading germs. The stronger, whichever one is stronger, is going to get to win. So if um, the host is particularly weak, their immune system is particularly weak at that moment, then they're more susceptible to infection. Um, this becomes particularly important in hospitals because many patients in hospitals are already in a weakened state due to their illnesses. This means that their immune systems are not very, may not be very strong and they might thus be more susceptible to infections. That's why as nurses, your role becomes crucial, okay? You're not just treating the primary illness, but you're also guarding against potential infections that could complicate their recovery. Okay, so now we have fully covered the infection cycle. Now, 
Another word, another way you might hear this described, the infection cycle described is as the chain of infection. And that's because they all kind of, you know, they all kind of lean into each other. And what we want to do is cut that chain at any point we can, right? If we can help the, if we can prevent the susceptible host from getting access to um, the, the agent, we can. And how can we do that? Well, we can help them boost their immune system. If we can prevent, we, if we can cut the chain by preventing germs from getting into the sick person, we're going to do that. How can we do that? Well, we can wash our hands. We can make sure that the wound care is done to the, to the book, by the book. So we're really looking for ways to just cut off this chain anywhere we can. Okay, last knowledge check question. Which of the which of the following is the primary reason hospitalized patients are at an increased risk for infections? A, exposure to various healthcare workers. B, frequent use of invasive devices like catheters. C, weakened state of weakened state of health due to their primary illness. D, presence of many microorganisms in the hospital environment. And I will be sharing the answer with you in five, four, three, two, one. And the correct answer is C, the weakened state of health due to their primary illness. When a patient is hospitalized, they're often in a weakened state due to that primary illness. This reduces their immune um, system's ability to resist infections, which makes them more susceptible. Um, for the other options, I get why you would have wanted to choose them. Um, so A, B, and D, those are all risk factors. However, the question asks you for the primary reason why the hospitalized patient um, would be increased sus would be at increased risk. And the primary reason is because, well, the immune system is weakened. Alrighty, thank you for watching. Please like, subscribe. Leave me a comment. Let me know what chapters you want me to do next. Right now, I'm really kind of bouncing around the book. So let me know what would be the most useful for you. Alrighty, bye.